Praise the Lord. Let us pray. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father Lord God Almighty. The big cliche says you are the reason for the season. You are, Lord, you are the reason for every season. You are always the reason. You are always the season. And so, Lord God Almighty, we will celebrate you, not just at Christmas time, but not just on Sundays, not just on special days, holidays, but at all times, we shall praise the Lord at all times. Your praise will continually be in our lips, O oh God. And so, Father, Lord, God Almighty, we magnify you this evening. We give you all the praise and all the adoration. As you are, O oh God, you, we are the generation of Jacob, the ones who seek your face. You say, you say we will never seek you in vain. The sons of Jacob will never seek you in vain. Say, so if we seek you diligently, we shall find you. Lord God Almighty, we ask that we find you tonight. That you give us the wisdom from above. And in all the wisdom, Lord God Almighty, you also give us understanding. The understanding of your ways, the understanding of your thoughts. Father Lord, we well, thank you because we know that to ask is to receive from you. Thank you, mighty God. In Jesus' name we pray. Uh, today, it's supposed to be practical Christianity, but in the next two sessions, are gonna be Bible studies. And I want to address some of the issues that we have been addressing one way or the other but perhaps not conclusively. So my topic today is that Jesus, is, Jesus will save everybody. Jesus will save everybody. This obviously is counterintuitive, especially in regard to popular Christian norms and culture, popular Christian notions. But you know, the mystery of the kingdom of God has not been revealed to Nicodemus. Uh, Thank God that he has opened our ears to hear, to understand his ways. So let us start. I mean, we're going to look at scriptures upon scriptures. So I'm going to put them on the screen so that we can follow systematically. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Now Moses warns Israel in Deuteronomy 28:20. The Lord will send you cursing, confusion, and rebuke in all that you set your hand to do until you are destroyed and until you perish quickly because of the wickedness of your doings in which you have forsaken me. Let me say that at any juncture, the way we normally do it uh, uh, in actual classes, you can stop me with a question midstream. So don't. If you don't understand something, you don't agree with something, you have some slant on that you want to present, please just raise your hand. I can see you even from this screen. He says, the Lord will send on you cursing, will send on you confusion and rebuke in all that you set your hand to do until you are destroyed. And until you perish quickly because of the wickedness of your doings, in which you have forsaken me. Now, the question is that the God that is love, will the God that is love do something like this? Will he do something like this? Will he afflict his erring children until they perish, until they are destroyed? You better believe it, because if you say so, he will do it. Uh, Moses is not misrepresenting God. He's giving what he had from God. So God will destroy his own children. Uh, and we have it stated in the law of Moses. In the law of Moses, his obedient children are stoned to death. And they are stoned to death by their parents and others. 
Deuteronomy 21, 18 to 21. Let's look at it precisely. If a man has a stubborn and rebellious son who will not obey the voice of his father or the voice of his mother, and who, when they have chastened him, will not heed them, then his father and his mother shall take hold of him and bring him out to the elders of the city, to the gate of his city. And they shall say to the elders of his city, this son of ours is stubborn and rebellious. He will not obey our voice. He is a glutton and a drunkard. Then all the men of his city shall stone him to death with stones. So you shall put away the evil from among you, and all Israel shall hear and fear. This is a commandment that came from Jesus. In the New Testament, Jesus said, Moses spoke, gave you the commandment of God. Hmm? Okay. If you assume that Jesus would not approve of this, and that this is some strange thing that comes from the Old Testament, which has no application to the New Testament, well, let's compare it to Luke 19.27. In Luke 19.27, it is Jesus himself that is speaking. And he says the same thing. Bring here those enemies of mine who did not want me to reign over them and slay them before me. Direct statement from Jesus. The disobedient, he says, kill them. Hmm? He says, kill them. So he is not contradicting Moses. He is confirming Moses. That is the nature of God. It's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Now, Jesus and his disciples were in a boat. And he was asleep in the stern, and they hit a storm. When they hit a terrible storm, they were afraid that they would drown, and they went to wake him up. And they woke him up with an accusation. They said, teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And Jesus rebuked them. Mark 4.40. Why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? How is it that you have no faith? But what exactly are they supposed to have faith in? They are supposed to believe, first principle, that with Jesus in the boat, they will not drown. Okay? But it's more than that. They are supposed to believe that even if they perish, they said, are you not, don't you care that we perish? That even if they perish, nevertheless, Jesus will save them. Huh? Even after they have perished, they would still be saved. Why would that happen? Because we have in Hebrews 7.25. Hebrews 7.25 tells us, Jesus is able to save to the uttermost to those who come to God through him. And so Jesus' salvation is not limited. It is a salvation to the uttermost. The salvation to the uttermost. We have an example in scripture, John 11. Lazarus was sick and Jesus didn't show up until he was already dead and buried. And there was some kind of complaint when he finally came four days later. John 11, 21. Now Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. You should have come on time. But really, it doesn't matter. 
that Lazarus had died. Why? Because Jesus is the resurrection and the life. Because Jesus will still go into death and still bring Lazarus out. He will still save Lazarus even from death. And I say, it's a shame that most Christians today still don't have the right faith in Jesus. Instead, they conclude that once a soul perishes, or once a soul is destroyed, it is beyond redemption. It is beyond salvation. They say once a soul perishes or is destroyed, it spends eternity in a burning, fiery furnace, which they call hell. But this is contrary to the revelation of Jesus, because Jesus reveals that God is love. So how can God, who is love, consign his beloved offsprings into a burning, fiery furnace for all eternity? Only a God who is hate will do that. But God is love. And there is one principle about love that we must always remember. What is that principle? 1 Corinthians 13, 8. Love never fails. Love never fails. Love never fails to love. Accordingly, Jesus, our Savior, will not fail to save. In fact, Jesus will not stop saving until he has saved every single human being that has ever lived. How long it will take him to do that? That is up to him. But he will make all things beautiful. In its time, every man in his own order, the salvation is going to come. This principle, Jesus expresses it again and again. Matthew 18, 12. What do you think? If a man has a hundred sheep, and one of them goes astray, does he not leave the 99 and go to the mountains to seek the one that is straying? And if he should find it, assuredly I say to you, he rejoices more over that sheep than over the 99 that did not go astray. Even so, it is not the will of your father who is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. It is not the will of the Father, that anyone should perish. And so we need to remember, because Christians <laughs> would somewhat don't want to believe this. Jesus is not just the savior of Christians. Jesus is the savior of the world. First John 4, 14. And we have seen and testified that as the Father has sent the Son as Savior of the world, God so loved the world. Not just Christians. He is the Savior of the world. John wants us to understand this. He wants us to understand this. He says in 1 John 2, 2, Jesus himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but for the whole world. Just understand it. It says he is the propitiation for this for our sins, but not for the sins of believers only, not for the sins of Christians only, but for the sins of the whole world. For the sins of the whole world. Why is that the case? Because according to James 2.13, the mercy of God 
triumphs over the judgment of God. That's a kingdom principle. It is the mercy of God and not the wrath of God that endures forever. Psalm 136 verse 1. His mercy endures forever. So when the judgment of God collides with the mercy of God, it is the mercy of God that prevails. It is the mercy of God that prevails. Micah tells us that in no uncertain times. Micah 7, 18 to 19. Who is a God like you? Who pardons sin and forgives the transgression of the remnant of his inheritance? You do not stay angry forever, but delight to show mercy. You will again have compassion on us. You will tread our sins underfoot and hurl all our iniquities into the depths of the sea. God does not stay angry forever, but he delights to show mercy. So, his judgment cannot be everlasting. His judgment cannot be everlasting. Uh, let's understand it. Okay, now, some scriptures are mistakenly believed to contradict this. Uh, mistakenly, because they don't understand what he's saying. Philippians 3.18, John says, and Paul says, many walk, of whom I have told you often, and I'll tell you weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction. It says, these people that are the enemies of the cross, they're going to end in destruction. Okay? But the, the truth of the matter is that this is a mistranslation. All right? Because well, <laughs> although they will be destroyed, destruction cannot be their end. Let me state it so that you understand. Although they will be destroyed, the destruction cannot be their end. Why? Because we must use scripture to understand scripture in case we have a mistranslation like this one. Okay? How, how do we resolve this? Well, Revelation 1 8, Jesus says, I am the Alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end. But God, who is the end, is not destruction. God is not destruction. God is love. Since God is love, the end of everything cannot be destruction. The end of everything must be be love. So because God is love, the end of everything cannot mean that man or the sinner will be destroyed, will be in a burning, fiery furnace for eternity. It is not so, not according to scripture. Jesus says you are mistaken because you don't know the scriptures and you don't know the power of God. Hmm? Power of God is the love of God. God is not power. God is love. And love is the most powerful thing on earth. Because God is love. Jesus tells us no one is good but one. That is God. No one is good but one. That is God. Well, since God is the end of everything, then the end of everything must be good because the end of everything will be God. Law of circularity. We came from God. I'm going to go back to God. Huh? So the end of everything must be good. He works all things together for good. He doesn't work all things together for destruction. He doesn't work all things together for ill. He doesn't work all things together for bad. 
He works all things together for good. But that is a process with God. That's a process with God. Huh? So let's understand the process hmm? so that we don't, <laughs> we're not confused. Huh? The psalmist confirms com, 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 com that destruction is only a means to the end of God, which is good. Destruction is only a means to an end. And that end is good. Remember, God kills in order to make a life. Huh? So in Psalm 90, verse 3, the psalmist tells us that God turns man to destruction and says, return, O children of men. In which case, there is still, destruction is not the end. He turns man to destruction and then says, return, return to me, O children of men. Okay, now. Redemption is different from prevention. I hope I'm not, I'm not being too academic here. Redemption is different from prevention. After destruction, then God redeems. Prevention means that he will not allow you to be destroyed. But redemption means that after you are destroyed, he will redeem. And in the process of that redemption, we return to God. Ecclesiastes 12, 7. Then the dust will return to the earth as it was, and the spirit will return to God who gave it. Everything returns to love. Everything returns to God. Everything returns to good, who is God. And so I say, we're all the offspring of love, and we will end with love. We will end with love. God is the mighty one of Jacob. How does he describe himself? Isaiah 49, verse 26. I, the Lord, am your savior, and your redeemer, the mighty one of Jacob. Different attributes of God. He saves and he redeems. He can save you from the fire. He can redeem, that means you, you will not get into the fire. He can redeem you from the fire. So after you are inside the fire, he will redeem you from it. So he, in fact, God likes to redeem better than he likes to prevent. He allows us, and he says, when you go through the fire, I'll be with you. Don't worry. When you go through the water, you will not drown. Okay? So, we need to understand that nothing, absolutely nothing, is beyond God's redemption. Because God is love, he even redeems what he destroys. Not only that, the Redeemer will not stop redeeming until he has saved the entire world. He will not stop redeeming until he has saved everything because that, that will not, they will say, Jesus failed to save some people. No way, there cannot be any failure with Jesus. You don't understand. <laughs> people who think that uh, have not understood the power of God. They have not, they don't know. Uh, in the day of his power, he will make his people willing. Okay? And we have those examples. We have discussed it where he just sees Matthew and says, follow me, and Matthew follows. Huh? We have those examples where he just sees the ZBD brothers and says, follow me, and they leave their father, leave the, the people that are mending their nets, and they follow. Power of God is the one that is moving them. I told people, I said, I didn't give my life to Christ. He took my life. I answered an altar call. I don't remember how I got up and when to say Jesus saved me. Something carried me there. That is my own personal experience with God. So destruction is not the end. It's not the end. Many will be destroyed and then they will be saved. Many will be destroyed. And then they will be redeemed. 
Let's listen to Jesus. Let's listen to Jesus. He's talking to some people. He said, destroy this temple, and in three days, I will raise it up. Huh? Jesus himself was destroyed, according to the scripture. Okay? Okay? Now, he establishes as a principle. Destroy this temple. That's not the end of it. I will raise it up, in which case, the destruction of a person, or the temple of a person, is not the end of the person. Huh? God is more than able to redeem what has been destroyed. That's what makes God God. Huh? The psalmist acknowledges it. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Yet Christians forget. They forget a critical benefit. Who forgives your sins? They remember that. Huh? Who heals all your diseases? Some don't acknowledge that. Who redeems your life from destruction? Most don't believe it. They don't believe that he redeems our life from destruction. But the promise says, don't forget all his benefits. There is redemption even for the destroyed. There is redemption even for the destroyed. Let us see it scripturally. Okay? Redemption for the destroyed. What happened to Israel? Hosea 13, 9. Oh, Israel, you are destroyed, but your help is from me. Yes, Ipalibu, go ahead. Uh, sir, my, my concern has to do with what I come to call the mystery of sin. We know and understand that with him is redemption, and that is defined by his love. Uh, but we also know that he judges and condemns sin. Now, if we have the understanding that in comes at the end of the day, it does, it does that not encourage sin and transgression? Does that not obviously put one at the point where uh, even your salvation, because there's a case of the, the, the dichotomy in Christendom where they say, saved once, saved forever, or you are saved and you maintain your salvation. Where does that fall into within this context of his own redemption and then his judgment and then uh, all of that coming well, inside? Well, 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 we're going to, come, we're going to come to that, Ipalibu. Um, remember, Jesus does not save the righteous. <laughs> huh? Jesus saves sinners. Okay? So, I mean, you know, remember, we're not, we're not talking about the principles of the Bible lesson. We're talking about the principles of God. And we want to understand how God does his own things. He saves sinners. Now, if you think that that will encourage sin, okay, then you must be wiser than God. <laughs> All right, okay, but we will see that there is no, you know, I mean, the, the wise man cannot talk anything to God because his ways are un un unsearchable. His ways are much higher than the ways of men. So he does not save the righteous, okay? The valuable lesson. If by saving sinners, he will encourage sin, the valuable can never be saved because. You are not righteous when you met him. Okay? You could not, you could never have been saved. So don't don't create a principle that is good for the Palibo, but not good for anybody else. But we will also see that in fact his own approach does not encourage sin at all. We will see that. Just let us let us let us go systematically. Huh? Okay. I say Israel was destroyed, and yet God says, I'm still going to help you. So we have this principle, Israel was destroyed. Although Israel was destroyed, what will happen to Israel? All Israel will be saved. Okay? So, you know, if we, if, if we, have, if we, if we, if we have the, the problem that we had in my mind, my brother, if Palibo is happy, then we say, then he's encouraging sin in Israel. Just relax so that you will see the wisdom of God. 
Hmm? Even though Israel was destroyed, nevertheless, God is going to save all Israel. And people will tell you, no, this is just going to save spiritual Israel. No, 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 no. The gifts and calling of God is without repentance. Okay? Once God has called Israel, Israel is my son. There is no way that he's going to go back on it. He's not going to go back on it. Okay? No matter what happens, his love is going to reach into anywhere, into the grave, into the uttermost, and will save that beloved son. Because as long as one sheep is lost, Jesus is going to find them. He is going to find them. Huh? So let us situate these principles, again, still in scripture. All right? God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. Right? With burning fiery fire from heaven, he destroyed the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. Nevertheless, Sodom and Gomorrah will be redeemed. Sodom and Gomorrah will be saved. Ezekiel 1653. When I bring back their captives, the captives of Sodom and her daughters, and the captives of Samaria and her daughters, then I will also bring back the captives of your captivity among them. When your sisters Sodom and her daughters return to their former state, and Samaria and her daughters return to their former state, then you and your daughters will return to your former state. So let's talk about, this is the Jubilee now. The Jubilee, everything returns to its former state, which is God. Huh? He gave them everybody the same thing at the beginning. Some people lost theirs, some people, but at the end, there is a jubilee and every, everything returns to equilibrium. That's the time of refreshing from the presence of the Lord. Everything, I say, is a law of circularity. Everything is going to go around and still come back to God. Okay? And still come back to God. Hmm? The truth of the matter is that the love of God cannot and will not be limited by anything. It will not, it cannot, it cannot be limited by everything. And sometimes we read scriptures, but we don't read them. We read scriptures, but we don't understand them because God loves the people that he has created. Why are you so mindful of men? We don't know, but he loves men. Huh? And so we have in Romans 8.35, what does God say? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Nothing. Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword as it is written. For your sake we are killed all day long, we are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing can separate you and then God stops loving you. No, 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 no. It doesn't change. It doesn't change. It does not change. So let us address the concerns of a valuable lesson. Peter says, well, some of these writings of Paul are hard to understand. Second Peter 3.16. As also and all his, in his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to understand, which untaught and unstable people twist to their own destruction, as they do also, the rest of the scriptures. People say, well, you know, I mean, if that's the case, then 
Ah, let us continue drinking. Let us continue fornicating. Let us continue to do all kinds of things. Now you can hear your father told us that, you know, I mean, uh, <laughs> you know, it will be saved in the end. It will be saved in the end. Hmm? So, well, you know, what are those things that Paul is saying that is people are twisting to their own destruction? Say so destruction is still a principle. I never said it is going to be, it's not going to be there. Paul says God wants everyone to be saved. First Timothy 2 4. He wants everyone to be saved. So Paul says he doesn't only want Christians to be saved, he wants everyone. First Timothy 4 10. God is the savior of everyone, but especially those who have faith. Uh, why, especially those who have faith, where you those who have faith will be saved before those who don't. But he's going to save everyone. Okay, so in this scripture is 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 yeah, it says he's uh, going to save everyone, right? So that you don't think that everyone is only those who have faith. He says, but especially those who have faith. Those who don't have faith is still coming for them, because every knee shall bow. Right? We're going to we're going to see that on Thursday. Mm -hmm. Okay, so he establishes this principle again in 1 Corinthians 5, 15, 22. As in Adam all die, even so in Christ, all will be made alive. There is no non-righteous, no, not one. As in Adam, all die. Even so, Christ in Christ, all, all, all will be made alive. The same principle. None was righteous under Adam. All will be made righteous, will be made alive under Jesus by the same principle, by the same token, by the same logic. Hmm? All died in Adam, all will be made alive in Christ. Some, you can say, did not die in Adam. Oh, no, 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 everybody died in Adam. Okay? Now, then come to the desire of God. Second Peter 3 9. Peter says, God wants everyone to turn from sin and no one to be lost. Then the desire of God is that God is that everybody should turn from sin and no one should be lost. But if God desires something, it will it always be done? <laughs> That's what makes God God. How can God want something to be done and it's not done? If it's not done, then it is not God. He is not God. But he is God all by himself. If you want something to be done, if you want something to be, he will. It will be. Huh? So Ephesians one eleven says, God works all things according to the counsel of His will. He works all things. I, I, you know, I mean, I, I should apologize to God for for this case because I shouldn't be writing it like this again. I was writing, <laughs> hey, hey, Holy Spirit, I'm sorry. I'm writing like this for years. He said, you know, I, I, I should change now. Uh, he works all things according to the counsel of his will. What does God say? Isaiah 46, verse 10. He says, my counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. My counsel shall stand. I will do all my pleasure. He continues in verse 11. Indeed, I have spoken it. I will bring it to pass. I have proposed it. I will also do it. Huh? It's going to happen. It's going to happen. God is not asking him for her opinion, whether I will like it or not. Hmm? It's going to happen. It's going to happen. Peter notes, he says that Paul's revelation that all will be saved was being used by some to justify continuing in sin. Can our Christians think, well, if all will be saved, then I don't need to be righteous. Whatever happens, I'll be saved in the end. Indeed, you know, Paul says, uh, Romans 5.19 is the one that really, really, you know, I, what we really used to confuse me. Paul says in Romans 5.19, the law entered that the offense might abound, that sin might abound. But where sin abounded, grace abounded much more. 
so that as sin reigned in death, even so grace might reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. He says, God brought the law so that everybody will become a sinner because nobody can obey the law. So that his grace will abound. Huh? However, Paul anticipated that many will conclude that this gives them a license to sin. And he says, wait a minute. Huh? Shall we continue then in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who die to sin live any longer in it? So you see, the, the problem comes from not having the mind of Christ. The wisdom of man leads to the presumption that the severity of God is the one that will lead men to salvation. Therefore, Christian fundamentalism creates an extra-biblical hell designed to frighten men into the kingdom of God. <laughs> God tells man, says, my thoughts are not your thoughts, Isaiah 55, 8. Nor are your ways my ways. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. And so Jesus notes that religious leaders, they teach as doctrines the commandments of men. They don't teach the commandments of God. They, 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 they create their own commandments and say it is God. In vain, they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. No. The greatest weapon is love. God is love. And it doesn't lead men to salvation through fear. On the contrary, 1 John 4.18 says, there is no fear in love. But perfect love casts out fear because fear involves torment. He who fears has not been made perfect in love. So God only leads to salvation through his love. This is what he says in Hosea. I drew them with gentle cords, with bands of love. I was to them as those who take the yoke from their neck. I stooped and fed them. You see, a basic requirement of salvation is repentance from sin. However, fear of a mythical hell does not lead to salvation. What leads to salvation? The goodness of God leads you to salvation. It is the goodness of God. It is the love of God that saves. When God is good to us, even in spite of our sins, we break down and repent. In the same way, the wisdom of man says, if Christ will ultimately save all men, why bother to live righteously now? Those foolish enough to think that, to think like this, says, <laughs> They are, they, 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 are, they are likely to fall from grace because no man is saved because of his own merit. That's why I say, you know, you are also saved as a sinner. And God did not say, if I saved you as a sinner, then you will continue with sin. No. There is none righteous. No, not one. So he doesn't wait until we are righteous to save us. No. Ephesians 2.8. By grace you have been saved through faith. And that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Not of works. 
lest anyone should boast. As a principle, if God saves some and doesn't save others, he's going to be guilty of hypocritism. If he saves some and doesn't save Pharaoh, whose heart he hardened, it would not be fair because he created Pharaoh for destruction. Hmm? So what does God do so that you cannot tell him that he's a God of favoritism? Romans 11.32. God committed all men to disobedience that he might have mercy on all. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. He committed all men to disobedience that he might have mercy on all men, that he might have mercy on every body. But the fact that all men will be saved does not mean, listen carefully, because we're going to talk about this, <laughs> we're going to talk about this on, 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 on Thursday. The fact that all men will be saved does not mean that all men will escape punishment. Hmm? Doesn't mean all men will escape punishment. Those who despise the grace of Jesus will receive big punishment. Hebrews 10, 26. If we deliberately continue in sinning after we have received knowledge of the truth, there is no longer any sacrifice that will cover these sins. There is only the terrible expectations of God's judgment and the raging fire that will consume his enemies. For anyone who refused to obey the law of Moses was put to death without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. Just think how much worse the punishment will be for those who have trampled on the Son of God and have treated the blood of the covenant which made us holy as if it were common and unholy and have insulted and disdained the Holy Spirit who brings God's mercy to us. For we know the one who said, I will take revenge. I will pay them back. He also said, the Lord will judge his own people. It is a terrible thing to fall into the hands of the living God. You know, but it's important to emphasize that this scripture is referring to those that are already believers, not even the sinners. Those that are already believers who they have received the Holy Spirit and then come and reject him again. That is a problem for them. Huh? Huh? Because when true knowledge comes and Christ is revealed by sight and not by faith, Many will be tormented by exclusion from his counsels. They will be tormented. He doesn't have to touch them. They will be tormented. I've, 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 I've gone through torment before when the Holy Spirit just withdrew. Huh? Just kept quiet with me because I said, you know, I mean, <laughs> I did it some time ago. Huh? It's terrible. Look, 1328, there will be whipping and gnashing of teeth. When you see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God and you yourself thrust out, they will come from the east and the west, from the north and the south and sit down in the kingdom of God. And indeed, they are last who will be first and the first who will be last. And this is really talking to Christians. This is talking to believers. This is warning believers. Hmm? Beware, because the first will be last. And the last will be first. Hmm? The first. I mean, that he's talking about here might be that Christian that despised the grace of God. On the day of judgment, it will be more tolerable for the unbeliever than for the unfaithful believer. It will be more tolerable for those whom the gospel was not preached than it will be for those who 
rejected the gospel. Luke 1247, that servant who knew his master's will and did not prepare himself or do according to his will shall be beaten with many stripes. But who did not know, but he who did not know yet committed things deserving of stripes shall be beaten with few. For everyone to whom much is given, from him much will be required. And to whom much has been committed of him, they will ask them all. Are these stripes countermand to destruction? Yes. Is there hope for the man after the destruction of the Lord? Yes, but the duration of this penalty cannot be eternal because God is love. God's throne of judgment is established in mercy. It is not established in vindictiveness. Isaiah 6, 16, 5. In mercy, the throne will be established and one will sit on it in truth. And the tabernacle of David, judging and seeking justice and hastening righteousness. The message is of a redeemer who will restore all things. Isaiah 126, I will restore your judges as at the first and your counselors as at the beginning. Afterward, you shall be called the city of righteousness, the faithful city. Zion will be redeemed with justice and our penitence with righteousness. Let's understand this principle. God is going to redeem with righteousness. Hmm? He's not going to redeem. In fact, you cannot redeem by burning somebody forever. It is his righteousness that he will use to redeem. His redemption will be in his righteousness. Okay, so we will look at the second part of this discussion on Thursday. But if you have a question now, you want to raise something or you want to add something, please let me see your hand up and let us talk. Otherwise. I will close this session. Anybody has a contribution they would like to make? Nobody? I'm still waiting though. Okay, it is the Lord that gives understanding. Let us pray. Thank you, Father Lord. You are King of glory. No man can teach any man about you. Mm -hmm. Flesh and blood cannot reveal anything, but only you, only you, only you, Father Lord. Only you. It is you that gives knowledge. It is also only you that gives understanding. And so, Lord God Almighty, I stand here guilty for some things that I am talking to your people about. It took me over 20 years to understand. You are king of glory. It will not take them long. It will not. It will not. It will not. Because that's why they're in healing wings. And that's why they, you have called your people the apple of your eyes. Say, the people in healing wings. They are the apple of your eye. Lord God Almighty, you will visit them. You will visit them on their bed when they are sleeping. You will visit them. I was, I was, I was sharing a testimony about you, Lord, with, with, with Karen. And I said, I said, and I said, I, I, I've never shared this testimony before. She said, you know, when did it happen? I said, over 20 years ago. I was reading the book of Luke and you decided to show me how it was written. 
And as somebody was reading it to me, I could see a film of exactly what was going on. That is, those are things that you do. I was seeing a film of the scripture. Huh? And I said, Lord God Almighty, you will visit your people because you are a God of revelation. You are a God that reveals mysteries to your people. You are the God that reveals treasures that are buried, hidden in the sand. You are the God, oh God, that reveals yourself to your people, oh God. And we in healing wings are the ones that by your grace, by your mercy, because of your loving kindness, it pleases you to reveal yourself to us now as a kinsman redeemer. We're not waiting for the jubilee. Father, Lord God Almighty, your judgment will start now for us, will end with us now. Thank you, mighty God. Thank you, because we shall yet praise you. We, shall, we will never stop praising you. We will never stop blessing you. We will never stop giving you glory, giving you honor. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. Amen and amen. Say to the righteous, you are the apple of God's eyes. Tell somebody here. You are the apple of God's eyes. You are the apple of God's eyes. Anybody that touches you is in trouble. You are the apple of God's eyes. You are the apple of God's eyes. You are the apple of God's eyes. You are the apple of God's eyes.